would like to applaud Joe and Sandy, who okay, came all the way from this one. Well, where is Henry? Here he is, this gentleman. And they've been coming from the very, very beginning um, of this project. And also Michael McKenzie, who couldn't be with us today um, as well. You may start. Over to you. <laughs> Over to you. Thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning. And what a special morning it is. I apologize for reading this, but I might duplicate things so I'm being safe. <laughs> We're celebrating 10 years of the hard work of the Friends of Villa Frere. And to actually be inside Villa Hay now, safely rescued from collapse, it really is a milestone. And there are many people who are responsible for this great achievement. It's an honor to be asked to give this talk, and it gives us a chance to say thank you to all the many supporters of the project, mainly to Edward, to Fernando, to George, and to all the committee, and especially to Heritage Malta. <coughs> My involvement began 20 years ago as I became curious about the life of my grandmother, Dolores Price, who was born in the villa. As a family, we came out to Malta in 2001, when I discovered more, and then, more importantly, John Hookham Frere and his lifetime achievements and legacy to Malta. After I'd written a book on this story, mainly for my family, I met Edward Syed. He had been told of the Lost Gardens by his professor at Malta University in 2004. Once we discovered this interest, we got involved in his work in trying to rescue the property and gardens, which were in a state of abandonment and ruin. Edward had at this time also met Peter Borg, who was a keen historian, and together we all encouraged each other to go further. We used to visit twice a year, and dig and excavate and support as much as we could. But Edward was very wise to wait until official permission was given in 2013 to give us some sort of security. Well, this is just the introduction to our story, and now Sandy will continue with the Freya background. Thank you, Madam President. <laughs> I've just realized that makes me the first geezer, or uh, bloke. Uh, yes, well, I mean, we kick off with, with John Hookham Frere. Um, there you see him. I've just noticed he's up there. I'm going to be a lot more polite about him than uh, when you get a chance to look at that picture underneath uh, with the, the description from the National Gallery of Canada from this picture, which describes him, this picture is showing him full of his own self-importance, which I think is totally unfair. He, yes, he, he could be an infuriating man by all accounts. Um, and he did, sadly, um, interfere with uh, uh, Sir John Moore's conduct of the campaign in 1800-something, rather, five, six, or thereabouts. Uh, during the Peninsula War, and that resulted in him being disgraced in England. He refused the offer of a job to go and be the ambassador to the Tsar of Russia, and in 1821 he came to Malta. Uh, he actually just came, headed for the Mediterranean for somewhere warm and ended up in Malta with his wife Elizabeth, uh, his sister Susan, and his wife's cousin, Honoria Blake. He brought with him his love of the classics. Uh, he was famous for the first translation into English of Aristophanes' four plays, which, if anyone gets a chance to read, they are actually still very funny. Um, and so he, he was an academic, um, and he, I, I can't read through this thing that once has given up, so I, I don't know what the rest of my notes say. Hang on. <laughs> Can I know? Uh, yeah. So he, uh, yeah, his interests included poetry and medicine, archaeology, which we'll come to. Um, he had enough money to give generously, 
um, and was well known in Malta for his generosity to, and it was at a time of great um, uh, poor, uh, poverty in Malta, the, the peninsula war, the, the Napoleonic Wars had ended, Britain actually wasn't terribly interested in Malta in the 1820s, um, and was much more interested in, in influencing the Greek wars that were going on at the time, the whole area of defeating or, or cutting back the Ottoman Empire. So whilst he was here, he was able to fund the work that we've seen out here, and, and, and he was famous for that. Um, he, where have we got to? Yeah, but, so his, his wife, the main, oh, if we go on, the, the, why did we, what happened there? Sorry, so that was him. Uh, the main reason he came to the warm climate was his wife, Lady Errol, who was the, uh, uh, the, the Damager Countess of Errol. Her husband had died in, in sad circumstances when he was quite young. She was relatively young. She was older than Frere. Um, she became quite ill after the death of her first husband, and so they came here on health grounds for this warm climate. They lived in Valletta to begin with, and later moved to, to, to this house in built to Villa Freire down, down the road there. Sadly, she died in 1831, only ten years after they came here, and she's buried in the Amsida Bastion Garden of Rest, and it was her death that prompted Chef Freire to finally start work on the gardens that he'd clearly been planning for some time. Sorry, I've gone, I've gone too fast. There was another uh, uh, person in the, the, the menage that lived here. There were five of them um, in... Yes, uh, oh, it moves on for me. This is really good. Um, <laughs> the, the captain of the ship that brought Frere to Malta in the first place, Captain Culpepper, was then... Um, rescued a child from the village of Lividostro, which had just suffered a massacre by the Turks during the Greek Wars. And he brought her back to Malta and basically gave her to Freire to look after. Actually, look up, brought up is too strong a word, because Freire was, was um, criticized later for not providing for this child's education or anything. But, um, they gave her the name of Statira after the uh, wife of the Persian king who features in the Greek tragedies that he'd been translating. Uh, um, and they gave her the surname of Lididostra after the village. This picture is entitled Statira Lividostra. It was sold at auction, it was painted in 1835 or thereabouts. Sold at auction in 2009, and I'm afraid to say I know nothing more about it apart from the picture, but it is utterly delightful. Um, it was painted by a, an artist called Jules Salle, also known as Jules Salle Wagner, because he married a, a lady called Wagner. Uh, he would have been, in 1835, the artist would have been 21. That's how he, he went on to live and was a famous art career. Um, and it's just a lovely picture, and it makes us think this is, I think, given the name, this has to be the girl who lived in this villa with, with Freire until she was about 16, when she eloped with an English soldier, or a Scottish soldier, and married him in due course. His name was Captain Hope, and she went back to live in, in Britain with him. This caused huge ruptures in the Frere family. Frere blamed his sister Susan for bringing her up to be in ill-disciplined. But um, sadly, that is practically all we know about her. She died in 1881. I found the records of that, and she's buried in Winchester, in England. Now, right on. There was also another person that um, uh, Frere sponsored and supported, and that is Mikhail uh, Anton Vasali, the father of the Maltese language. Fred befriended him in 1825. 
he had written, uh, Vasali had written um, an, a Maltese English dictionary and a Maltese grammar and wanted it published, but this wasn't possible at the time because there were no facilities to print the Maltese typeface in, in Malta. So Frere arranged for these books and also translations of the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles that Vasali had made to be set up in England. The proofs were sent to Malta for Vasali to proofread. They went back and they were then printed in England. Uh, it was a short-lived association, sadly, because uh, Vasali, who was then age 61, um, was in poor health, and he died penniless in 1828. The church refused him burial because he was married, although he had taken holy orders. He was never actually ordained as a priest, but he, he had trained as a, a priest and had taken holy orders of some sort, um, and the church refused him burial. Um, and so he was eventually buried in the Anglican uh, Garden of Remembrance of Messi de Bastion. And uh, I have no doubt that Frere played some part in getting that organised, because otherwise he would have been buried in a pauper's tomb out in the open. There's no record of where he was buried in Messi de Bastion, but there is a memorial stone which is placed very close to Frere's grave. Talking of which, I visited that last year and was struck by, uh, looked across at this garden here, and I was struck by a very remarkable alignment. You can't see, this is the, the garden as we know it, and there's the temple, and here is the turret, which is just outside the visitor center, with the wall behind it. If you go and stand beside Freer's tomb in fanciful, supposition is that after his wife died and he started work on the garden, he changed the plan quite radically to incorporate this viewing platform where he could sit and look out across the water to the, his wife's tomb. And what an amazing memorial that is for a very beautiful woman. Right, so history going on. Uh, this is the first known photograph of the garden, taken by uh, the Reverend Calvin Jones, who was a friend of Henry Fox Talbot. It is dated as the spring of 1846, which would be literally within months of Freer's death. It shows the temple and, the, and the, here the turret that we've just been talking about, and all the balustrades still standing there, and a wellhead here, which is now behind the temple. After Freire's death in 1848, January, 1846, January 1846, the gardens became rather neglected, and although the villa was rented out to various people, uh, this shows a, a drawing that was made in about 18, well we know it actually says it was 1848, so we believe that artists knew what date it was when he wrote it. <laughs> this is the top of the famous pit, which was excavated by Freer back in the 20s, in the 1820s, when they discovered this hole, mostly filled with clay and rubble, but very well-worn stones round it showed the signs of huge amounts of water had been flowing through this hole down to the sea. And, importantly, uh, evidence of human artifacts. Uh, now this is interesting because his father, Freire's father, had also made a famous discovery in, in Norfolk uh, in the 1750s, which had totally turned the ideas of archaeology and, uh, uh, and um, uh, human history on its head. You've got to remember that in those days, the, the received wisdom was that the earth was formed in 6000 BC. That was when Genesis happened. And most, and most people still believe that. What Freire's father discovered was flints which showed human occupation which had to be several million years ago. Not, no, no, sorry, several tens of thousands of years ago. Or at least 10,000 years, pre-Ice Age, uh, as we would date it today. 
So Freer's father was famous for that. Freer found this hole with evidence of, of, of human occupation at least 10,000 years ago. I don't think even now the Maltese uh, uh, archaeologists have really investigated that. Sadly, it sits under the car park just outside the temple at the moment. So one day, it may be opened up. Right, so let's just quickly look through one of the key dates that we're going to cover from now on. Uh, Frere came here in 1821 and took the, the lease for the villa. In 1831, his wife died and he started work then on the gardens. 1846, but he died and after that there was slow decline of the gardens. Largely, one thinks, because you can think of the cost of keeping a place like this going. There was a lot of money needed, and the Freire gone. His money was probably all back in the Freire family in England. Uh, there was no, no means by which keeping a garden like this going could be funded. We know that the Messina family, which had the benefit of lots of money, uh, a bank, they were bankers. Uh, they acquired the, the, the lease to the villa and the grounds in, 18, in seven, 1876. And in 1885, when Commander Edward Price, that well, then Lieutenant Commander Ed, Edward Price, married the, the daughter Giuseppina of Count Messina, they gifted the estate to him, 1885. And he commenced, again, the Messina family was well off, there was money around. The Price family, I, we don't know any details of the financial of the Price family. He was not the eldest son in any, by any sense. Uh, but obviously there was enough money then to start uh, keeping gardeners going. They didn't have the benefit of all you lovely volunteers. In 1930, uh, it was visited, there was a country life feature and up in the visitor centre you could read bits, I think it's all available, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the country life article showing some lovely pictures. Then in 18, well, in 1932 I think Commander Price died and in 1939 his wife Giuseppina died and from then on the gardens basically have slowly fallen into this into, uh, in, into destruction. In 1952, the Spiteria family acquired the lease to the, to the house along and this part. In 2013, the thing we were all celebrating, the Friends of Villa Freire were created. So, having covered the time from the end of Freire time to the start of uh, uh, to, to Price's time, I'll hand back to Joe from the family point of view, if you can explain what, what happened then. Go on. So here oh. we... Yeah, sorry. Go on. We come now to the next era of Villa Freya, which Sandy's covered a little bit as well, but I'll just say my bit. And so after Freya had died in 1846, the next key date is when Count Messina took on the lease for his summer home. His townhouse was Palazzo Messina in St. Christopher's Street in Valletta, which is now the German Maltese Circle. And you can see this lovely marble crest of the Messina family there on the floor. And the anchor indicates his connection with shipping. The Count and Countess Messina had settled in Malta from Sicily some years before, having to escape the fighting in the Civil War there. And in 1886, their daughter Josephina married Edward Price, my great-grandfather. He was a British naval officer and had met the Messina family on his many visits to Malta when they entertained visiting naval people. And here's a rather lovely picture of Edward Price and Josephina on, on the temple steps. Is it a reenactment re of his proposal? <laughs> he took his hat off. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this next 
slide shows the classical temple in all its glory at the top of the gardens. And Commander Price on the step, no. Yeah, the children. Teddy, no. Mary, your grandmother, uh -huh. and her youngest sister. Yes, it, it is true. And, the, and you can also see the wonderful stone lions at the bottom of the temple stairway. And one of them was discovered amongst the rubble. And it can be seen in the uh, visitor center. And this is the one with um, Commander Price on the stairway. Um, it still exists, but not in very good condition today. So in his time, Commander Price restored the garden and made it a very beautiful place. And it was visited by many important international visitors over about 40 years. He added to Frere's classical garden, including an authentic Japanese garden, which sadly no longer exists as the primary school was built on top of it. But to make the Japanese garden, he must have had an advisor. And the only clue that I have found is this photograph of a visiting naval, Japanese naval officer. Perhaps he was the advisor. We can tentatively date this as around 1919, when we know the Japanese had a fleet based in Malta, supporting the Allies in the World War I. And this shows a fine decoration of the gateway to the Golden Buddha Temple. Some really interesting Japanese inscriptions, if there's anybody who can translate them. <coughs> but this is a slide showing a wider view of the garden perhaps at a later date, because the archway is no longer there, and the various lanterns and the temple are still intact. The garden was reached through a tunnel that can still be seen, leading to the primary school grounds. And the school children are today very keen to learn about Freya and the history, and they often come to the gardens on visits. The tunnel's now been cleared, and the cherry tree has been planted to replace the original one that had died. So, in um, 1930, the beauty of the gardens was luckily recorded in an article by Country Life with many lovely photographs to show exactly what it was like. And this is a colorized version of one of those pictures, and so it brings it to life really well. And this beautiful one is of the upper terraces overlooking Cedar Creek. It was known as Engagement Terrace. Again, we don't know whose engagement. <laughs> and then there were many ponds and wells in the garden. And this was a geometrical one filled with reeds. Very unusual. But it was key in keeping with the classical theme from Frere's inspiration. And here's another simpler pond in the lower garden. Amazingly, it was still intact. And it's beside this building that we're in today, known as Villa Hay. It's believed to have been used as a home for Frere's mother-in-law when she visited. And you can see her coat of arms on the, above the front doorway. The Price knew, family knew it as Honeymoon Cottage. And it's thought to be a much older building than the villa itself, probably already on the land when Frere bought extra parts of the hillside above the villa in the 1830s. So on the death of Josephina, in 1939, Why? Why is that okay. the government took back the property lease and the gardens suffered great neglect during the wars of the Second World War. But the next inhabitants of the Villa Frere were the Scuteri family and they came to the villa in the 1950s. And they've also shared their memories of life here and the excitement of recreating something worthwhile for Malta. <coughs> right from the beginning, I felt a strong attachment to the gardens because of the memory of my grandmother, who I was very close to. And that will never change. And the long and fascinating story of those who've created and lived here seems to interest all who become introduced to it. So Sandy will now take you through the restoration that's taken past over the last 10 years. Thank you. Well, Today, only a third of the garden that previously existed is still accessible. The rest having been built over by the primary school, extension to St. Luke's Hospital, including the ultimate insight, 
salt, its helipad. This map shows the extent of the garden as in its heyday. The large shady part at the top has been built over, but luckily much of the main cultivated part of the garden is still accessible. But starting at the top of the picture, everything in the shaded area is gone. Let's reflect for a moment on what's been lost. The beautiful upper terrace with its view out over to Mesina Church. Bulldozed to make way for the nurses school of the uh, St Luke's Hospital. The elegant viewing platform which I've just referred to for the pit. Bulldozed to make way for the helipad. Um, and Oh, no, but it needs a monster. <laughs> That's the trouble. Yes, it's all right, don't worry, don't worry. Yeah. Um, and so working, the, the, the unshady part is, is all still accessible. Um, and what amazing work has been done in the past 10 years. So working up upwards, here is the villa down here at the bottom left with the, the, the Marina Street outside. Uh, the lower garden here and Villa Hay, which is where we are, exactly on the end of that arrow at the moment. Um, the garden, what, what is sometimes known as the Garden of Birds, but now I believe is known as the Sunken Garden, um, <coughs> over there. The farmhouse is over there and its workshops. And then going on up, you have the, the octagonal pond, which we'll come to in a minute, um, and the royal gazebo and then up to the area just outside the visitor centre, which is actually located there at the moment. Uh, so, this is how it looked when we first visited, uh, back in 2001. Um, and was marks, if you like, could be said to be, the, well, from our point of view, the beginning of rediscovery. We walked through the hospital grounds and this is what we saw, the sad remains of the once lovely temple and I think that's what prompted us to get involved. This photo was taken by Michael Mackenzie a few years before. He has written a book about uh, his wife's great, great, great grandfather, William Frere, John Hookham's brother, who also happens to be my great, great, great grandfather with us something that we only discovered about five years after being involved with this, when somebody wrote and said, was I relate, was Joe relating to me? <laughs> <laughs> he, he having, well, it was Michael Kenzie, who, that, that is him, um, who had been tracing family trees, and she, he, I'd say he wrote to Joe and said, well, was, uh, was, he really, was she related to Robert Alexander Tindall Disco, grandson of so-and-so, great-grandson of so-and-so, great-great-grandson of so-and-so, of, of William Frere. Um, I am Robert Alexander, but you may call me Sandy. Um, that's the way it works. Our story actually began when we were on a family holiday in Malta, and um, on a whim, literally, our children said, why don't we see if we can go and find where Granny, Great Granny was born? Um, and what followed was a series of chance encounters uh, whilst looking for the place down on the bottom, we stopped and talked to a lady said, asking, did she know where Villa Frere was? And she recognised the name Frere. She said, oh yes, I was taught by Professor Peter Vassallo, who was always talking about John Hook and Frere. And there's Hook and Frere Street. If you go up there, we went down Hook and Frere, found Hook and Frere Street. There was a, 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 a sculptor sitting in his garage, creating a statue of the Virgin and Child. And we stopped him and said, where, can we, where is Villa Frere? Um, and he said, oh, yes, yes, I know. Well, uh, go into the hospital, pretend you own the place, and just walk down and you'll find it. <laughs> and we did. And that, this is roughly what we saw. So, um, inspired by that, Joe wrote, put together some, found all these old photographs and put them together into the first book, which he wrote and we published in 2000. And I don't know, 2002, 3, 4, no, 5, 2005. And this is what it looked like. Uh, we 
garden terraces were unrecognizable. There was rubble and ruin everywhere. It was a daunting task. And that was what we started, all of us, I say we, we played a very small part in it because we could only be here uh, so often. And we used to, and this is what five years later is starting to look like. There are lots of impediments to effective work. Hornets, mozzies, and for us poor Brits, the hot weather. <laughs> and a few other things. <laughs> Some were more difficult than others. This thing managed to redistribute most of what we carefully tidied <laughs> before having an illegal warfare. And uh, I don't think that happens too often, but that was quite a dramatic one. Here is our good friend Henry. Thank you. <laughs> commencing work on what we later came to know as uh, Henry's Wall, cutting away the, uh, the, the, the Bignonia. Uh, but that's the tunnel through there to the primary school, or Japanese garden if you prefer to say it. This beautiful prickly pear took us two days to get rid of. We dumped the remains below the helipad. I have to say, I felt a bit sorry for it. You know, nature has a way of recovering, and I'm glad to say that its children are thriving there below the helipad. <laughs> and bear fruit as well. They bear fruit. <laughs> I noticed you've got one that's in fruit. Is that, uh, is that one from that? Yes, it's a baby from that as well. Oh, good. Mm. Uh, so, we can risk making some Pretty pale wine at some point. <laughs> Here's another example of what we faced. Somewhere in there is my lady wife finding her way, hacking her way through the undergrowth. <laughs> the work was hard. The main steps down to the what we now call the gazebo were had to be cleared. Each one and the earth at Edward's insistence all carried up to the top. So if you can imagine here we are clearing each step filling up a wheelbarrow, dragging it all the way up to the top. But it was a good way to save the soil, which has come in very useful since. One of the few structures that was still visible amongst all the ruin was the, apart from the large temple at the top, was this little tempietto, which became known as the Royal Gazebo, because we know plaques were placed there in Price's time, commemorating the visits by Queen Mary on her way back from the Denny Derba. Now, I read recently that Queen Mary was notorious for effectively stealing things from places that she visited. She didn't want to. That's rather nice. And then the host that she was looking after would be told by a courtier, just send it to your palace. <laughs> this is famous. So I would love to know what she stole from me. I don't think it's a question I can really ask. Uh, it also commemorates the visit of Queen Marie of Romania. Now, not a lot of people know anything about her, but she was famous. She is actually responsible for the creation of the state of Romania, which at the end of the First World War didn't exist except in her name, she was the Queen. Um, and she attended the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 and worked marvellous ways with all various diplomats to persuade them to put in a, a large chunk of the, of the uh, peace accord at, at the end of the First World War, creating the state of Romania. So she is important. Uh, anyway, yes. Another queen, here is my wife clearly telling me to stop taking photographs and get on with the work. Uh, as you can see, the building's nearly falling down and, and Edward made it one of his priorities to get that back because if we'd lost that, that would have been a disastrous. And money was found and then you know what it looks like now. It was not all hard work though. Here is lunch on the terrace outside the visitor centre, probably in the second or third, possibly even the very first year. Uh, um, 
Lunch generally provided by Peter. Peter Borg on the right. Sadly, he can no longer be involved with this work, but what he did in those first three or four years is it was amazing and, and, and has created a, 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 an intellectual basis for a lot of what we know about the place now. As Clarence progressed in the upper terrace, we started exploring further down, and here is the old farmhouse building, roughly as we found it. In Fred's day, the gardeners would have lived here to take care of plants and watering. Small animals would have lived here too, such as goats, ducks, and chickens. The roof is broken, very dangerous and overgrown. The doors are rotten, and the rooms below were full of rubble. It was going to be a lot of hard work to make this building safe again. This is what lay below the broken roof. When we first gained access to the garden, to this part, it's fallen over, and here is Edward administering surgery. <laughs> the pond was found completely covered over to start with. Nobody knew that it was there. Uh, um, under all the weeds and acanthus, been renovated with endless care to match the broken pieces. Famous jigsaw puzzle, really, which Edward spent many happy hours fitting it together to produce this. So there's the, the tree restored, growing well, the, the pond with the fountain <laughs> and everything. A cat, the bees and hornets, as it happens, love this area. <laughs> Unfortunately, so do the mosquitoes. The acanthus pops up everywhere. Oh, why, why did you do that? I just touched it. <laughs> I, I, yeah, that's all right. That's OK. Yeah, there was, I touched there. It went in advance. It must have felt You knew I wanted to. Uh, and there's now newly planted cyclamen growing. It really is a garden. One of the many extraordinary features of the garden is its irrigation system. We don't know the details of the design or who designed it, but it was clearly an engineer of great ability. There are over 13 wells listed in the, shown in the various plans with systems. Well, not so much wells. There are some wells. Some of them are systems. And this is an example which is uh, the, the team entered a few years ago um, up by the temple. That is 20 feet. But I should, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at everywhere there because you went down there. <laughs> there um, and we've got lots of photographs of it. It's an extraordinary construction. <clears throat> and there are other photographs of amazing decorations in, inside these systems. Okay, now I'm going to hand you back to Joe to cover the last few aspects of the reconstruction. So we're back now to 2017, when the project was beginning to be more than an initial enthusiasm. It needed more structure and support, financial and physical. So a new volunteer introduced himself to save the day. Fernando the Horticulturalist. <laughs> Thank you. And his knowledge and experience, together with Edward's restoration influence, has been vital to the success story so far. And Fernando's father, George, has also become involved. And there's nothing he can't mend or build or create in stone <laughs> or wood. Together they make an amazing team, along with the other loyal supporters. And here they are. You all know them. Edward. Oh, <laughs> so with Fernando's experience in gardening, he's brought life and colour back to all parts of the gardens. At the bottom of the terrace steps, you even forget you're in the crowded city. The classical urns are full of flowers and the pathways are cleared. So now you can make a proper tour of the gardens. I've included this photo just to show it's not all hard work, but fun as well. 
There's a pathways at the top terrace under the old oak and olive trees were amongst the first to be excavated and restored. Initially, this was the only place for entertaining visitors and enjoying the fruits of the hard work, as well as a place for fundraising parties. So in 2018, with security in the gardens, this old stone bench is once again back in its rightful place with a sea view, as it always was in Frere's day. And then several stone well heads were returned as well, but they've been kept protected in the Casaleone in Santa Venera. And also, following a generous donation, the balustrades have been rebuilt round the viewing platform and the Defun floor surface restored. And since then, more financial support has permitted extensive work to be completed with careful planning. And in 2018, President of Malta, Marie Louise Colliero Preca, came to unveil a stone plaque commemorating the restored royal gazebo, and this is the moment of it. Safe, restored, and beginning to look like something that Frere, and indeed Edward Price, had, would have been proud of. So we're returning to the lower part of the garden now the area next to the farmhouse in a secret and very central garden. And now I gather it's not called the Garden of Birds anymore, but I'm calling it the Garden of Birds. because We refer to it both ways, yeah. sometimes the Garden of Birds and the Sunken yeah. Garden. <laughs> sunken Garden. But as we did not have access to this area, all that was possible was this tempting view. We could see the old stone baths and masses of plant growth but we did have photographs that showed what it once looked like. It was very tantalizing. So when permission was eventually given, the moment had come to enter this little garden. Opening the blocked stone doorway took the careful work of George and the team. And they very kindly waited till we came on a visit in Malta in 2019. The final knocking through. So now you can walk through the doorway into this garden as originally intended. And here we can see the balustrades on the stairway now being made and fitted by George and the team. A stylish little reenactment of the original <laughs> photograph. It's amusing to compare this with the next slide from Price's Day. This is, an old <laughs> this is an old photograph of the 1930s showing my grandmother's sister Mary with a friend. About three years ago, Villa Hay was very badly dilapidated. It seemed almost beyond repair, but restoration work was eventually allowed to start. The roof timbers had fallen in and the storm did further damage. But the basic structure was just about standing. Scaffold poles were needed to secure what remained of the roof supports, and years of rubbish had to be removed. It was very hard and dusty work. Here's George and Fernando beginning to restore the roof. And when the roof timbers were secured, the roof surface could be replaced, which was brave work. Here's Caroline and George laying the little wooden floor. <laughs> and George creating the new rooftop balustrades. And once cleared, the interior rooms had to be refloored, and this meticulous and patient work carried on. It's this room here. This, this is this room. room. Uh -huh. This, this, room. Room. this yeah. room is this room that we're actually in. And here are Kirsten and Mariana, two happy, hard-working volunteers, filling the buckets with debris, to then be removed from the site. It's a perfect example of young and enthusiastic energy. It's still very hard work. The round stone pond is now cleared. It's been returned to its former use. Endless clearing and cutting back plant growth has returned this garden to its original charm. Doors and windows are mended and now painted a lovely bright blue to match the sky. It's a very really well chosen color. And polishing the newly painted and glazed windows looks a better option for Martin. And then last year's Christmas scene inside Villa Hay signifies such a lot of progress and hope. 
It's so typical of the love and attention to detail that the Friends of Villa Freire have taken on brings the place alive. And last year, we knocked on the front door here for the very first time with my grandmother's brass dolphin door knocker. It was a great treat. It's always been on her front door. So it's now returned home. <laughs> Today the roof and the outside walls, back and front, and the shutters and windows have been restored. The inside's habitable once more. And on this 10th anniversary year, it's marked by the rescue of Villa Hay. And here are many, but not all, of the various loyal volunteers. They're so keen and dedicated to do what they can to support the project under Edward Fernando and George's professional eyes. It is like being a member of the Villa Freire family. They make everyone feel so welcome. It's never possible to completely restore the gardens, but it's now what Fernando originally called a contained ruin. With all the restoration that's taken place, you might like to think of a different and more positive solution. <laughs> that originally came from Edwin, so... <laughs> <laughs> Joining the classical temple at the top of the garden with the rest of the grounds is an obvious next step, and it may happen, but much negotiation needs to take place for this next move. But every year brings new hopes and surprises and achievements. And they has had the monthly garden open days, which were a great success. And I hope you've enjoyed our little snapshot of the life of the gardens. <laughs>